When I first came down in the tunnel, it looked dangerous, man. It looked real dangerous. Dangerous, man. I moved to New York and I would see lots of different people sleeping in my neighborhood. So I just would try and sort of hang out and help out a little bit wherever I could. And I met this one guy called John Murphy and he would talk about the tunnels and uh, how he was tired of his situation on the street and tired of being woken up every night by the police. He had heard about the, that you could live underground and build yourself a house and, and this fascinated me. So I started to go exploring and after about a month of going into different tunnels I ended up um, finding the tunnel that we made the film in. It really never started off being a film. I just started off, I, I was just, you know, really curious about it and just wanted to make some friends and I was just trying to help out a little bit. But after spending a few months out on the street, I realized that none of the people were anything like I thought they would be like. And all of my sort of ideas about what a homeless person should be like were shattered. And also by this time, I'd, um, I'd made some pretty good friends in the tunnel and didn't like seeing them in that situation. So I wanted to get them out. And one night we were sitting around a fire and we were sort of laughing about something that happened that day. And uh, one of the guys says, man, somebody should be making a film about this. So I said, well, why don't we do it? And what we figured we could do was we'd make the film and uh, we could sell it and the money would get everybody out of the tunnel. And at the same time, uh, they would have to be the entire film crew and that way they'd be helping themselves get out of the tunnel. I wish I could take credit artistically for a lot of the things that happened, uh, why it was shot on film and why it was shot black and white and why I wish I could say, oh, I made, you know, that decision was made because of, you know, I wanted it to be this or that. And it really wasn't. It. The reason it was shot on film was I said to a friend of mine, you know, I want to make this film. And he said, well, then you've got to shoot it on film because it's a film, right? And films are shot on film. And the black and white came out of it because another friend of mine said, well, if you shoot color and you don't know what you're doing, then you're going to fuck it all up. It's going to be red. It's going to come out green or blue. But if you shoot black and white, you can still mess it all up and, and uh, it will still look cool. People will still like, still be able to watch it. Basically, every decision was kind of made like that or in that vein. You know, I walked into this camera house and I'd never, I'd never picked up a camera before in my life. I'd never even seen a movie camera apart from in pictures. So I walked into this place and I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing cameras everywhere and it was like a little kid in a candy store. I was just sort of running around and asking loads of questions and a guy came up to me uh, by the name of Lowry Drake and uh, a lady called Jackie Zimmerman and they sort of asked what I was doing and I told them what I was doing and I was like show me this, show me that. And no, Mark came in with a Super 8 camera and I just thought well, he would be better off doing it in 16 because it's a, more, it's a larger format and it's easier to work with, developing, film, everything would be easier so. He came in, he was very quiet, he asked questions and he was always very concerned about the equipment, how to handle the equipment, not so much because he wanted to use it, but he was also concerned of taking care of the equipment. And they pulled out a camera and they said, this is what we think is the best thing for you to shoot on. And so I said, you know, can you show me how to load it and those type of things, and they took their time to do that. He's a quick learner. <laughs> we show him how to put film in and load the camera and so on, you know. As far as using it, the technique he taught himself that in the tunnel. But basically he used the same camera, the same type of camera, using an Airflex camera, SR. And initially we were just, we were renting it and I, I sort of paid for the first week or something and the second week I said I'll bring you a little bit of the money but I'll give you the rest at the end of the week and that just kept dwindling down. And in the end I, I had the camera for maybe two years. 
I believe you got far and more than any of the mother motherfuckers out there if you really look at it. You're, you're spending the night. You're bled dead. You're one of us now. You understand what I'm saying? Welcome to the fucking family, kid. I'm proud of you. But now, you're in Stokey's world now, all right? All right. You're into the pot. Now you got to taste the flavor. I miss the seasoning. Kid, you live far and get far if you just listen what the fuck I'm saying. I'm not after your money. I'm respecting you as being you. Because I see what you're doing is the same type of shit I'm doing. You can't keep it unless you give it away. So the shit you earn, you spread it amongst the people. Whether if they white, black, Chinese, Puerto Rican, Jewish, Kung Fu, Bong Wu, or whatever. You understand what I'm saying? I respect that 100%. And I really believed we could do this. I mean, I, I just saw like a lot of wasted potential and people that had, you know, for whatever wrong they'd done in their past or however much they'd sort of fucked up their life and ended up in that situation, that they, just that they deserved better. Another reason that I wanted everyone to be the crew was I thought, well, they've been very isolated. You are really isolated on the street and you really are sort of by yourself. And you have friends around you, but you're pretty much working for yourself when you're on your own. But in an everyday, your typical average work environment, you're working with people, and so you've got to sort of learn how to work in a team again. And everybody being the crew would, would do that. To me, my whole job really was just pumping confidence in people. And I, I, I think if somebody believes that they can do something, then they can pretty much do anything. And in the very beginning, we really didn't know what we were doing, so we were all just sort of all over the place, but after about three or four weeks, they would say to me, where do you want to film tonight? And I'd say, oh, I want to get a shot of the train or you know, whatever it's going to be. And by the time I got down there, um, cameras are loaded, lights ready, sounds ready, dollies ready. It was a full, full working crew. Before we started filming, we sort of had to prepare the tunnel a little bit. Um, it's very dark in the tunnel and you need light to do anything. So. Um, one of the first things we did was uh, tap into the electricity and I didn't actually tap in myself. Uh, Henry, Henry was kind of like the electrician of the tunnel and so he tapped in. Well, they scared to come to power because they take any time electing, you know, it'll shock you. But, I, you know, I'm sure I'm sometime, you know, you, as long as you deal with one wire at a time, you're not going to get shocked. But once you go to dealing with two, then you connect it, you just like... That's like a, I guess that's like a light bulb or whatever, a hot plate or something. You, when both of them come together, there it is, you know. Don't you? Yeah, I'll give you an idea about it. I hope this well, what, what I'm going to do, it makes some of them much scared. It don't, it don't help too much, you know. If I do this, and, and then, you know, some of them get twice as scared. So I watch careful, because this is going to be, a bang. Wait a second. Am I going to get hit by holding this bus? No. See you do that, you know. You show a person that, then some of it just make them twice as scared. You know what I'm saying? They know, they know this will kill them. Then they wonder, you know, they think you're crazy to even do it, you know. But see, this is the ground, this is the positive, and either one gonna do nothing without the other. We ran the wire all the way down the tunnel, and we put um, sockets at various sort of points along the way where we could plug in at any time. And the other thing that I wanted to do was we needed, I wanted to get moving shots. 
because in all films that you watch, there's always like a nice moving shot. And uh, we were fortunate that there was abandoned train tracks in the tunnel. And there was a lot of houses that were built alongside of this track. So one day, you know, from, from hanging out on the street and from hanging out with different people for a while before this happened, because it was about three months after being in the tunnel that the film idea came about, you sort of get to know what people had done previously before they became homeless. And uh, one of the guys had worked on the railroads for years and years. He had laid track. So I figured he must, you know, he must know his stuff about tracks. So we were walking down the tunnel one day, talking about something or other, and I just sort of threw out the question, how wide's that track? And he answered me, you know, straight away, so-and-so by so-and-so. So I said, oh, okay, he knows his tracks. So I said, oh, all right, can you build me something that can run along the track smoothly and hold a camera, lights, a couple people, and just sort of run all the way down here? So he said, yeah, I think I can sort of manage that. So the next day I sort of get up and I come out of my house and I'm cleaning my teeth out on the tracks. And I look down the tunnel and I see a little campfire going on. So I decide to take a wander down there to see who it is and sort of say hello. And we didn't have power tools and we just, we just didn't have the money for that. And so what he had done is he had taken these little metal rods and he was heating them up in a fire until they went red hot and then he was burning the holes through the wood instead of a drill. And uh, he took the wheels off a shopping cart and bolted them underneath and he built a whole platform and he basically built a dolly that would run along the tracks. And the first one was a little rough around the edges um, and eventually it got uh, burnt down. Then we built another one and somebody, and we didn't use it for a long time, and somebody ended up making their house out of it so they could sleep in different areas any, any time. They just wheeled their whole house sort of down the track. And I felt a little bad kicking that person off. And so then we built a third dolly, and the third dolly was the dolly. You know, when you're, when you're filming stuff, you, you have the decision, do you buy film because we, we, we did have to buy a lot of film too. Would you buy the film and shoot it, or would you buy a little bit of film and develop it? And so we chose to buy more film and just not worry about developing. And we did for a long time. And it got to the point in uh, the houses in the tunnel where the film was just building up and piling up. We filled every fridge that we could, and we'd filled cupboards and cabinets. And people were using piles of cans as seats. And it was just, it was just getting a joke. And Ralph said to me one day, he goes, man, we've got to develop this film because we've got to know what this looks like. Everyone's been working for so long by now, you know, and nobody has a clue what it looks like or, you know, nobody has a clue about anything. Well, when Mark first came into the lab and the story he told me, uh, I was amazed. Uh, subject matter, number one. Number two, all that footage he had and uh, hasn't seen a foot of film the first thing we did is uh, get the film into the soup to make sure he had an image on it. And uh, that was the start of the relationship about six years ago when he first came in. So I give him all the, I go there and I just unload. We're unloading bags and boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of film. And uh, he says, all right, come back in a couple of days. And we did. And we went into a high speed screening room. We sat down, he threaded up the first roll of film, and um, it came out. And that was to us, man. We didn't even think this thing was going to come out. Technically, the people that helped him uh, along the way, he, he was very, very fortunate. And I think being ignorant to filmmaking helped him. He went to, to make a difference for the homeless people. You know, filmmaking was, I think, secondary to him. Uh, he, the bug stung him and it uh, bit real hard. I even had to keep the little diary at the time and, and yesterday I was in storage sorting out my storage unit and I read this little diary. I read like, I had like the first 60 days of filming or something. It has a piece in there about the lab that we were sitting in there and that the film came out. You know, that we were just overjoyed that it came out. It was really special. It was a really special thing. It really gave us like, all right, we're on our way. 
Well, you talk about uh, low budget. This was definitely a zero budget. I mean, uh, anything that came, Mark had put up himself, and there's only so much money. I'd run out of film one time, and I was all pissed off, because any time you're filming anything, you think it's the biggest thing since sliced bread, you know? And if anything happens, especially in documentary, and especially when you're dealing with people living on the street, one day they could be there, and the next day they're not there. All this stuff seemed to be happening in the tunnel and I was missing it because we couldn't afford the film. So I went to um, my lab. Bob said, all right, let me make a phone call. So he called up Kodak. And uh, the guy at Kodak, he kind of gets in trouble when I talk about this, but I can't help saying it because he did a good thing. And they're not supposed to give out film. But Bob had told this guy, Bob Mastronardi at Kodak, what I was doing and so this guy Bob said, tell him to come down. So me and Ralph went down there and we did just come out of the tunnel and we really looked like we had just come out of a tunnel too. I mean, we couldn't get a taxi down to this place. And we go to Kodak on head office on 31st Street in New York. And we walk in there and uh, Bob comes out and we shake his hand and he sits us down and says, tell us what you're doing. And uh, we sat there and we told him what we were doing and he said, what film stock are you shooting? So we told him and we basically walked out of there that day with enough film to, to go for a long, long time. There was a, a slight defect. And like I said, it was out, um, the film was on the verge of outdating. There was nothing wrong with the film exposure and developing. It just had this defect, and people wouldn't accept it. And Bobby had boxes of it. He told Mark, come on, take, help yourself. And, and they were in awe of the storyline, too. When I told Bobby the storyline, of, of what it was all about, he, uh, you know, he got into it too. I mean, we were walking out of places to saying, man, I can't believe they just said yes, because they should have said no every time. And it was like a joke at some point. We'd even be saying, you know, the force is with us, because, you know, it really felt like there was something a hell of a lot bigger. There was something a hell of a lot bigger than, than me and, or anybody else that was pushing this film. No, I'm sleeping uh, here now. Mark's sleeping, trying to be a homeless. Who's that? Mark. Right, oh, 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 yeah. oh, glam ass, yeah. old GQ ass. On the floor. Yeah. Uh, on the floor. <laughs> hey, hey, well, he fucked me up today. He come out here with some goddamn farmers. I ain't know who the fuck he was. I'm about to say, look here, man. Oh, Meet me in front of Big Nicks, man. Oh, I ain't got shit for you right now. Yeah. With his Long Johns? I mean, with his what? Yeah, oh, with yeah. His yeah, that was cool, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> motherfucker, I'm so don't believe shit. It was hard. Yeah, it's hard to recognize sometimes. Yeah. Yes, but you'd yeah. be surprised who's who. Yeah. Now, yeah, this yeah. motherfucker got more dough than Moses. Mm -hmm. And walk around up. here like he... Talking about he's cold. Yeah, all he needed, <laughs> the, the way he looked at the yeah. day, all he needed was a cup. I didn't believe that. Yeah. <laughs> all he needed was a cup and a cup. <laughs> that motherfucker would have been jingling <laughs> like a motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah, get all the food line and get one of the yeah. pantries. You could tell him yeah. shit. Yeah. Yeah. He blended in with us, you know. Blended yeah. in like a motherfucker. Yeah. 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 I mean, he mm -hmm. got his shit going on, though. Yeah, yeah, he, I give him credit. See, that's one thing about me. I give credit when credit is due. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The film took a long time to edit. And it wasn't that I was just being that picky with it. It was just, I can't, structurally, Melissa and I knew what we wanted. But when you're shooting a documentary, you know, you're just shooting. We just shot. I just shot anything that was interesting to me or anything that was interesting to the people in the tunnel. We just shot and shot and shot. And you don't really think about what you're gonna do with it. You just shoot it. Um, and so when you get into editing, you know, we have 50 something hours worth of footage. And I knew the film couldn't be longer than 90 minutes. And then you gotta try and uh, make an hour and a half out of all that footage. So I've got this structure. I so say, yeah, I wanna use this structure. But you gotta find it in the footage to fit that structure. And it still makes sense and it still you know, hit emotional chords that you want to hit and take whoever's watching it on a journey. There's a lot of characters in the film, so that's always a challenge when you have a lot of characters, um, especially if some of the characters um, aren't there throughout the whole film. Um, some of the characters that were very important in the end weren't there in the beginning, and also the basic problem that the camera was locked off, so you couldn't cut scenes, it was basically one shot, so you had to build clips upon clips 
and instead of creating a scene where you'd go, you'd finish with that character or, or that scene or that idea, and then you'd go on to the next one, you had to, you'd like have part of an idea in a clip, and then you'd have to build with another character and then find something else in the first character to go back to. So you get a whole section that felt like a scene and was complete. I maybe was cutting for about four months or three months on a flatbed because I didn't know that there was this thing called an Avid. And I was lucky, I met a filmmaker called Leon Gast. He did a film called When We Were Kings. And uh, he's a great guy. And he said to me one day, why are you, why are you cutting it on a, on a flatbed? You should be on an Avid. So I said, well, what's an Avid? Oh, nah, it's just, you know, you've got to see it. It's like, imagine you've got a whole you know, pile of shit and you want to move it over there. Well, you're doing it with a shovel. And an Avid's like doing it with a bulldozer. So I said, oh man, I've got to go on an Avid. So I transferred all my work print to tape and I go on the Avid. And we were cutting uh, for maybe three or four months on the Avid and then ran completely out of money. It was really awful when we ran out of money. Um, not only just, it was depressing and it was just that we were going ahead, really finally getting a hold of the material and getting somewhere and then all of a sudden it's cut off. And, you're not sure that you're going to be able to start again, though I knew eventually that Mark would get the money. Uh, I was completely out of money for about 15 months, about a year and a half. And it was tough because I was kind of sleeping in the editing room. And when I lost the editing room, then I lose my place to sleep. And, you know, I've been working for almost, I don't know, two and a half years at this point, every single day. You know, I've slept in the tunnel and I've done just all, I mean, it was a whole accum accumulation of everything and just the whole momentum, you know, we were really working hard. And then, and I was always in denial about that. You know, I figured I'd have the money, in, you know, a few, you know, it would, wouldn't take me more than a few weeks and we'd be back up and running. And the weeks just plugged on and plugged on. And I, you know, sitting there trying to write letters to companies who I knew wouldn't understand what I was trying to do, but asking for money and, getting answers like we have target audiences and they like to see this and they like to see that and can you put more drugs in it and just all this crap and I walked away from all of it and it was uh, maybe a year down the line it was just a really dark time I ended up actually staying with a lot of the guys in the film and they would find that quite quite funny actually they say look at you now you bum <laughs> They say, man, you went from taxi cabs and sushi to walking, no, to the subway and McDonald's to walking and eating out the garbage. And they were laugh, they laugh a lot of times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they were really there for me. I really, you know, without that, I mean, they were really more supportive than anybody. And what's that something? Money. That's like they say, more money, more money, more money, more money, and more motherfucking money. You know what I'm saying? I started, rather, getting involved in Dark Days when I met Mark Singer sitting at a bar in, uh, in New York. And, uh, and we were introduced by a mutual friend. And I'd actually heard about him in the past, but I thought that he was kind of urban myth, that there was this bloke who'd been down in a tunnel, had been living down there for two and a half years, had met a group of homeless people, had shot hours of film of them, and then had, had re-emerged with all of this material, but hadn't yet done anything with it and I knew basically he hadn't because he'd run out of cash. From the second I'd heard about it I thought wow that's that's wicked I'd really like to get involved I'd really like to, to help this guy out because I thought I probably could and uh, and I suggested that to him I was like I, I think maybe I know some people who have some money which they'd like to invest in a project like this would you allow me to to get involved and to start you know putting it around and showing what little you do have to to some people and uh, and he was pretty reticent about that because his whole thing was stopping people getting too close to the project because creative control was absolutely critical to him. And, uh, and so we started off pretty slowly putting a proposal together and, and meeting up with a few people and, uh, and explaining that if they were going to get involved there were very strict rules. They couldn't come to the edit room, they couldn't see a cut, they couldn't hear the music, they couldn't, nothing. They, they weren't going to be involved, they were silent investors. I'd gone to see this company that said that they wanted to do this stuff and they had offered me a bunch of stuff and I went back to Ben and I said, look, there's this company that wants to get involved and they want to 
help me with a film and do all this stuff, and I think I'm going to take it. He turned around to me one day and he was like, listen, I found a, uh, an investor uh, completely independent of you who has got an Avid, who's got an office, who's offered me an apartment, who's offered me pocket money, and, uh, and full creative control on the film. And I thought, OK, well, that's, that's it. If I don't come up with something this afternoon, then I'm going to have blown it. And I wouldn't have gone with this other company anyway. I kind of bullshitted Ben a little bit and told him I was, they offered a lot more than they really did. Um, thinking it would sort of propel him into doing something. And uh, he did. You know, I, I, need, I said I needed 10 grand to go back into editing. I called my bank manager in England. And, uh, and I said, all right, I've got 10 grand in the bank, send it over because I'm going to have to put my money where my mouth is. And I did that. And it was, it was a kind of symbolic moment because as soon as that had happened, all of the investors we've been talking to, they all came through with the money. And I uh, probably had about 10,500 bucks to his name. And um, he gave me the 10 grand. And he's been broke ever since. Which I feel a little bit guilty about because I actually said to him, if you come in on this, you're going to go broke. You're going to go downhill. And, and he has done, um, but in a good way. He's no longer a waiter, so that's a, you know, that's a good thing. He's now you know, a producer. It was 15 months in the, in the editing, and, uh, which was much, much longer than we ever anticipated it was going to take. Because we thought when we first started off talking, we sat in a cafe, we wrote on the back of a napkin what we thought it was going to take to finish this film. And if I was to look at that napkin, which I still have, now and uh, compare it to the budget which I know we've now blown through, we spent 12 times as much money than we initially anticipated we would and we thought we were doing it right in the beginning. You know, there was a time I, when I ran out of money, I couldn't, I ran out of money first that I couldn't pay Melissa and she too just said, you know, don't worry about it and, you know, we'll figure it out later. And for months I said to her, you know, I'm afraid so I'm not ever afraid to take myself down into a, a position that would be uncomfortable for a lot of people. It doesn't bother me because I know I can handle it, but I don't want to take anybody with me. And so I was always afraid when anybody got involved or offered something that I was going to take them down with me. And, and Melissa, you know, worked for a long time without getting anything back and was putting in that sort of time that I was putting in the editing room. So, you know, she really, uh, I, owe her in a, in a, I owe her, as I owe a lot of people, um, in a big way just for, for, for doing that type of stuff because it was very difficult for her, I know, during that whole editing process. I wanted to do something different with the titles of the film. So I have a, a good friend of mine called Margaret Morton. So I called her up and I said, you know, I really want to have somebody that, I want to find somebody that's really young and really hungry and is really good at like um, typography and design to, to maybe do these titles. And it's got to have like a street background. I met Mark during my senior year at Cooper Union. I was in a class with a teacher who was doing a photo essay down there in the tunnel. And she was friends with Mark, met him down there. And I convinced her that I knew what I was doing. And she believed me and asked me if I wanted to do the titles for him. And uh, not knowing what I was doing, I went in and met Mark, screened the film and loved it, convinced him that I knew what I was doing. And we uh, basically uh, figured it all out from scratch. Well, the only type you see in the whole film, besides when you're outside of the tunnel, is Graf. There's one of the people living there, Tommy, and his friend Brian, who came down are pretty well-known graph artist. Brian wrote Ment, and everyone pretty much knew who he was, whether or not you knew him. You see where he lives, his hand style and pieces, stuff like that, all over the walls. And that had a lasting impression on me. There's even a scene with Brian and Tommy spray painting on a wall. When I started, it was kind of a, uh, it was too, it's too complicated for your average person to read. For someone who's not used to looking at graffiti, it was a little hard to differentiate an, an N from a U or like, you know. So it had to be toned down a lot. So the end result was kind of a, 
a mix in between graph and like Roman typography. It's a weird medium. And it was just a matter of going to Pearl Paint, picking up a white oil stick marker, getting black paper and just drawing out hundreds and hundreds of letters. And actually the logo was a one-shot deal. And if you look at it, you can see the difference between the original and the end result and how we manipulated things. Mark and I would sit there and take one little piece from a U, put it on an M, a piece from a Y, put it on this and that. I mean, we must have spent like 30,000 hours working on that thing. But it, it came out nice. You know, there's not many people complain about it. Whereas I think if we, if we went straight with the graph, you get a lot of complaints everywhere. No idea of the music for the film. And one day, Nick Morley calls me up and he's like, a um, mate of mine's in town and uh, I think you should meet him. You know, he's really good with the music. So I say, oh, you know, Nick, I don't, nobody, I don't really want anyone up in the editing room. And oh, he's a good guy. He used to sing in a band called The Cult. His name's Ian Asprey. Oh, you'll, you'll like him and you two will get on well. So I said, all right, it'd be nice to meet the guy. So he comes up to the editing room and we start talking and I just, I, I don't know, I liked him and I said, do you want to watch about half an hour of the film? So he said, yeah. So I show him the half an hour and at the end of it, he says, who are you going to use for music? And I said, man, I've got no idea. And he goes, DJ Shadow. He goes, oh, he'd be perfect for it. And I'd never heard any of Josh's music before. So I went to uh, Tower, one of the CD places and bought a bunch of CDs, took them back to the editing room, listened to them, and was just like, I was just floored by it. I just, it was just amazing. So I started cutting it into the film and it just fit. It fit like it had been written for that film. I don't even know how to describe it, but it was just, it was there. It just said everything I wanted to say. So I called up Ben and I'm like, I found the guy for the music. And Ben's like, who is it? And I say, DJ Shadow. I wasn't that familiar with, with Shadow's music, but I, I knew of him, and I knew that he was quite a big shot, so I was thinking to myself, all right, who's second on the list? And I said, no, this is it, mate. This is, he's the only one that can do the music for the film. So I'm, sit, I'm sitting on the couch one day in the editing room, and Melissa is looking through the paper, and she sees that, that Shadow is playing a gig downtown. So I call Ben, and I say, I say, Ben, he's in town. He's playing at this place called Wetlands. I can't go down there, but how about you go down there and write a letter and give it to him? And I wrote him a letter saying, Dear Mr. Shadow, this is what we've done. We think you're brilliant. You know, we'd love to use your music. And, uh, and I thought to myself, if I go to a gig where this guy's playing, the chances of me getting through the bouncers to actually present him with an envelope is just non-existent. I'm not going to be able to do it. So he calls up a friend of ours called Meta. And Meta's gorgeous, beautiful girl. And we figured if anyone's going to be able to get backstage, Meta's going to be able to get backstage. And Meta does get backstage. And she gives the letter to this lady that says that she's DJ Shadow's manager. So for the next few months, Ben's talking to this lady, and I'm cutting the music into the film. So every time I watch the film, I'm hearing it with the music. So there's absolutely no way that there could be, for me, there could be anyone else doing it. At that point, if I couldn't get Josh to do the music, I, uh, I probably wouldn't have had any music in the film. After a few months, this lady arranges that she says that Josh, Josh wants to see a tape. And so I say, well, you know, I don't send tapes really to anybody, but if he wants to see the film, you know, Ben and I will try and we'll get the money together and we'll fly out to wherever he is and we'll show him the film. So she says, okay, well, where do you want to screen, where do you want to do it? He's in San Francisco. So where in San Francisco do you want to watch the film? So funnily enough, the cheapest place, the cheapest screening room in San Francisco is Francis Ford Coppola's personal screening room. So we were like, man, let's see what Francis has got. You know, let's go to that screening room. So we, we booked time at the screening room for a certain day. And, uh, you know, we're on our way out to San Francisco. 
We went to the airport, five o'clock in the morning, presented our tickets over the counter, and the guy looked at us in that blank airline kind of way, and he was like, the plane's been cancelled. I mean, we have that, that moment of, no, 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 that's not possible, it's really important we get on that plane, and he's like, yeah, well, fuck it, yeah, tough. So we spent the day waiting for another plane. And While we're in the, the airport, we get a phone call, Ben gets a phone call from this guy who says he's Josh's manager. And Ben's like, I've been speaking to his manager. He goes, he goes, I hear you're interested in my client. And Ben's like, we're flying out to meet Shadow. We've got a screening with him tomorrow night. He's like, he doesn't know that. So I realized I, I had to pitch the, the film in the Tower Air Terminal to Richard when we were leaving 15 minutes later to go and meet Shadow. He told me after, he was like, okay, well, I'll call you back in four or five hours. I said, no, 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 you've got to call me back in 10 minutes because I'm getting on the plane. And he said, well, where are you going? I said, I'm going to San Francisco. He said, why? I said, to meet Shadow. He said, well, pff, I don't know. I don't know you. He doesn't know you. So then that all turned out. He did call back 10 minutes later. He's like, you set it up. So finally, they agreed to it and we fly out. And uh, I'm very nervous and very quiet. And I said to him, look, I hope you're not going to mind, but I've, I've sort of cut some of your music in the film and I've kind of cut it up a little bit to, to uh, fit the film. And he said, no, it's fine, it's fine. So we screened the film and I sat there nervously throughout the whole screening, seeing every single flaw that, could, that there was in there. And at the end of the screening, it seemed like forever that nobody said anything. So I went down and really it was just a date for me and my girlfriend at the time. It was like, uh, you know, want to go see a movie, we're going to go see this at this place. I just was, I, I walked into it fully prepared just to say, you know, it's a great film, but I, I can't, I have too many obligations right now. And um, I saw it, and uh, you know, the rough cut, and I just took a deep breath and I went, well, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'll do whatever I can to, to help you out. And he was such a nice, you know, you've probably heard this a lot, from other people, but he's just a really humble, genuine person, and um, is very different from the sort of personality that you encounter a lot in, from my experiences in the movie industry. So, so we all politely walked out of the building and waited till he put himself in his car with his girlfriend. He drove off, and we ran around the corner. We were like, Bye! jumping up and down, straight down the pub. And it really was a, uh, it was like a reassurance at that point. A, we had just got one of the best musical artists around to do the, do the score for the film. And it was just another sort of, it was, a, it was just another sort of dream that came true and materialized with this thing. The first time I saw the film, I think Mark's real goal was to get me to just agree to let him use what was already tempt in festivals or, you know. I think it was more about that and I think that, um, me doing new music for it would, would have been like a bonus. And uh, uh, I just was amazed, as with a lot of aspects of the film, at, again, his sense of um, what was appropriate for the scene musically. And just, you know, I thought he did a really good job choosing the cues. Um, I think only about half of them were in the first time I saw it, and then he went away and in the process of refining the editing in New York, he put in some of the uncle cues. And especially, you know, the Richard Ashcroft Lonely Soul cue at the end, I think is, people always will mention that, you know, they thought that that was particularly effective, as did I. And he's a brilliant guy, Josh, as well. I mean, this was a little while ago that all this happened, and since that time we've, we've stayed good friends. And I really have a lot of respect for him because, you know, he gets offered to do all of this stuff and where he can make a lot of money all the time. And I'm not saying this because he did the music to the film, but he just, he, he turns down stuff where, because he doesn't believe in it. And he really only does what he really believes in. And, and I really, uh, 
I really have a lot of respect for that. If Sundance was the first place anybody saw it. Anybody, no, I mean, nobody saw the film before that. Even investors weren't allowed to see the film. It was the night before that we got on the plane that we walked out of the lab with wet prints in the cans <laughs> and took them on the plane with us the next morning. And that was interesting, because that was the first time that the whole, the whole deal had been very much that it was, it was private. Nobody, a very small group of close friends saw it. So when we first went to Sundance and we sat in a room with 250 people all watching the screen, that was a pretty big moment, because not only was it Sundance, but it was also the first time that anybody outside our close group of friends had seen it. And, uh, and I remember sitting at the back, and I'd heard all the stories about Sundance, and, uh, and I was... I knew that I was sitting next to a buyer from Artisan Pictures. So I was really conscious of this woman who was sitting beside me. And, uh, and I was also being warned that a lot of people would probably get up and leave partway through the film, because they would be juniors, they would be going off to tell the people who they were reporting to whether it was something that, you know, they needed to come to the next screening of to check it out, to buy it. And I had this great image that we were going to be involved in a bidding war within three days and, you know, the price was going to go up through the roof and all of this, and it was getting quite kind of high-minded Hollywood style. The first thing that I noticed was that Miss Artisan was fast asleep. And so this was the whole thing. I was like, oh, fucking hell. And, uh, and then a few people left. But at the end, everybody stood up and they gave it a standing ovation, and it was, that was brilliant. The Freedom of Expression Award honors the film which best investigates and illuminates an issue of social concern. As a jury, we felt that the award might be misinterpreted as being given to a film more on the basis of its subject matter than its artistic merit. We wish to make it clear that the winner in this category is being recognized for its qualities on many levels, artistic, metaphoric, and humanistic. But the true triumph of this film is the intimate and respectful way in which it reveals the lives of its subjects, creating an indelible portrait of a community which exists where few dare to look or care to look. This beautiful and unforgettable film chronicles a hidden struggle to, to create light out of darkness. It turns on the light and makes us see. For these reasons, we are honored to give the Freedom of Expression Award to Mark Sayers. 2000 Audience Award for documentary film goes to Mark Singer for Dark Days. so many people that, without whom this film really would never, ever, ever have even got off the ground. And so, um, really for everybody who supported me, helped me, taught me, fed me, clothed me, and, and loved me, um, and everyone in the tunnel, this is for you. I and I guess it's worth it to talk a little bit about why the film was worth doing in the first place beyond it being a, an amazing story. It really makes you not look at people who you see lying under a duvet on the street and just put them in another place. You can really start to see that everybody's got their own life, they've got their own history definitely and reasons why they're there which are way beyond what everybody just blanket assumes. You know, he may be doing the drugs or he may be alcoholic or whatever, got all of these things which, which are forcing him into that spot. But at the end of the day, these people have, have families, they have senses of humor, they have ways of getting by which are ingenious and amusing, you know, all of this stuff. And if as many people as possible can see that and be exposed to it, then, you know, we've done something worthwhile. You try to make sense of it. And then when you sit down and screen a print with sound, it, it just blows you away. This is a true independent movie. And, and you know how strong he was about giving up uh, creativity. He didn't care what it cost him. He was going to have control to the end. That's the true story. It's not made up. Or, uh, 
there was no script to follow. He felt as, uh, he, he followed what was in his heart and, and he really, I believe it made a big difference. I believed in this so much that I even said to everybody in the beginning, I said, if you work with me on this, I'll get you out of the tunnel. I don't know, I generally sort of live my life like that. I just think that you just, you just got to have a little bit of faith in something and also be willing to take the first step. I just believe that if you're not afraid to fail and you're just going to give it a shot, then most of the time it will work out okay.